Like I was told that there are some leftover questions from the earlier period, so let's have the questions. Do we have the traveling mic? Hello? Yes, okay. I can't, I, I can't restrain my curiosity any longer, so I wanted to ask you about... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> about about those seeking seeking birth or mm-hmm. seeking rebirth, mm-hmm. and and how is that really possible? I mean, in what for? In, in which of the six realms would they? How would that really work? Okay, um, you have to remember that in the suttas, the Buddha never gives a full list of all the possible realms that are out there. Oh. Um, it's only in the Abhidhamma that they start saying, "Well, these are this is the." everything that is there, there. So there are all these possible, as, as, and what they call them in the Thai forest traditions, kind of these little states of becoming that don't fall into the main lists. And those seeking birth, are actually, it's actually kind of a temporary birth that they're taking. It's like renting a house for, what, for the time being before you settle down and get your own, get your own house. Kind of like renting before you buy. Kind of like renting, or it's... <laughs> And usually the people who are in that state tend to, you know, people who are psychic will see them, they look like the person they were before they, before they died. And my teacher had a student who, whose job in, involved driving around a lot in southeastern Thailand, and she would come across to accidents, and she would see the dead people lying on the side of the road, but she would also see the people kind of standing around looking lost. They didn't know where to go. And so she would stop the truck that she was driving and she would, you know, dedicate the merit of her meditation to them and they kind of disappear, go various places. But there's this kind of intermediate stage where you're kind of stunned and you don't know where to go. One of my favorite stories about this is uh, in Bangkok, when my teacher was teaching, there was a, it was a uh, cremation monastery and the Thais you know, don't cremate right away. The, you know, that's the start doing feudal services, but the actual cremation sometimes may happen later because they feel what they're going to put on a good funeral, you have to save up money, you have to make sure all the relatives can come. And so you wait until everything is ready and then you cremate the body, which means you've got to keep the bodies around. And so they'd have what they call envelopes, song. That it's basically a place that's just big enough to put a coffin in. It's made out of either bricks or concrete blocks, and you could just basically plaster it and seal it up until you're ready to open it up and then they'll like to break the plaster, take the coffin out. And the monastery where he taught had a whole rows and rows and rows behind the monastery. And there was one woman who was meditating one night with him, and she happened to see a vision in the meditation where she was a group of people doing the ceremony for placing the coffin in one of the, one of the envelopes. And there was a man standing at the entrance to the envelope wearing a suit. And he looked, and as everybody left, he looked left and right and went into the envelope. That startled her. She left meditation. She looked down, and sure enough, there were people dispersing from having done that ceremony. So she went down and she asked him, the person who died, he looked like this, and she described the man in the suit. They said, yes, that's right. So she went back to see a John Fu, and she said, what do I do now? So he said, well, get back in meditation, see if you can get that vision again. And she did. She said, now look into the envelope. And it was like he was kind of squatting next to his coffin, looking at his body, not really knowing where to go. And so she, and then he said, okay, now dedicate the merit of your meditation. And it was like, she said, like this light came out of her. And he was like kind of a deer in the headlights at night. He kind of looked at her and his eyes lit up for a second and he was gone. So there's this kind of intermediate stage, especially people who haven't practiced, they're really attached to their bodies or they're really attached to something else. And it's kind of the intermediate stage. Um, one more story about envelopes before I tell you another story. Um, there was one of the monks who was staying at Wat Makut the monastery there where he was teaching, and he decided to do walking meditation between, in the rows between the envelopes. And the first couple of nights he was kind of you know, a little on edge, all these dead bodies around. But as he did it night after night after night, he got more and more used to it. Until finally one night, he, as he was doing the walking meditation, I guess I'm going to be pretty good, I don't really feel any fear here at all. All of a sudden this hand comes out from one of the envelopes. <laughs> Well, it turns out it was an empty envelope with no coffin, and it's a place in Bangkok where um, drug addicts tend to go. <laughs> Quiet place, nobody bothers you. Um, and so this drug addict was reaching out and saying, Lumpi, Lumpi, do you have a match? And that's, uh, you know, El- Venerable Brother. And Venerable Brother almost had a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> So 
you don't mess around with envelopes. Okay. <laughs> there was another weird case where this, um, I was invited to chant at this house. There was a, the grandmother of the house had died and she kept entering people's dreams saying, I can't go on because I buried a treasure behind a tr under a tree behind the house and I want to make sure somebody knows about this. And so they checked and sure enough under the tree was this box with money in it. And then, so they dedicated the merit to her and then she came back into the dream she said, I don't want to go yet until I hear the Mahasamaya Sutta chant at least once. <laughs> Well, it turns out very few people memorize this, but she said, there is a monk here in Riyong, and so-and-so knows that monk, and I'd like that monk to come and chant it before I go. Well, I was the monk. So here I am chanting for a spirit. <laughs> and it wasn't the weirdest thing I did in time, but it was among them. Yeah. <laughs> she left after that. Possibly the weirdest thing I did was one time we had a funeral service. This this guy comes to the monastery and he says, um, we're gonna have, I'd like to invite you and this other monk to come and chant the funeral service at our house. But he was smiling as he said this. He said, why are you smiling? Who died? He said, you'll find out. So we get to the house and it turns out they had these vegetable plots. That, you know, sort of like the Chinese farmers do where they make a raised plot and they just fill it with vegetables. And two of them had died thoroughly. And the wife was convinced it was foul play, that someone had taken a herbicide and killed their vegetables. And so she, what she was going to do was have the monks do a funeral service for the vegetables. <laughs> and then she was going to put salt and hot peppers in the water that she used to pour after the, you know, when the monks were dedicating the merit. And this was going to, you know, this was going to go out and sort of you know, get the person who had done it, done the foul deed. I said, wait a minute, you know, what if it was your husband who did this by mistake? You know, they had only one tank and they used it for fertilizer and they also used it for herbicide. What it made me think he didn't clear out the her clean out the herbicide enough, he fertilized the plants. Do you want this to be a curse on him? No. Well, as long as you're here, let's do the funeral service, funeral service. anyhow. So here I am with the other monk chanting a funeral service for dead lettuce. You know. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's 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 up there on the list of strange things I didn't tell <laughs> There's a question back here. Oh, yes. I, I just wanted to ask you about this phrase, stream entry or entering the stream. that's come up a couple of times this mm -hmm. uh, today. And um, I, I don't hear other teachers... I, I hear some teachers using it, and I've never really been totally sure what it means. What it means is you have your first taste of the deathless, and basically the path comes together. And then it kind of creates this opening which goes into this other dimension, which is neither in space nor in time. But because your powers of discernment, your powers of concentration are not strong enough, you start grasping at it and that kind of pulls you out. But at least it confirms you there is this other dimension that can be accessed through the mind, through the path. Which is why they say that a person who's had this experience has their conviction in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha is confirmed. That the, what the Buddha is talking about is true. There is a deathless happiness that can be attained through, through the practice. And the, the reason they call it entering the stream is because from that point on, you are guaranteed that you will go to awakening just as a stream flowing out to the ocean. The water in that stream is guaranteed to get to the ocean. And in this case, stream entry is at least seven more lifetimes. At most, at most, at most. It can be less. But what also happens is, in the process of leaving space and time and coming back in, you realize space and time didn't begin at your birth date, or your, exp your experience of space and time didn't begin at that time. I mean, this goes way back. You may not have specific memories of previous lifetimes, but you realize, okay, there was more. Which is why that's part of the, part of the experience. There's a question here. Um, the Tibetans have a ritual after death mm -hmm. where they pray and chant or whatever over the body for three days mm -hmm. and thinking that it takes that long for the spirit to leave. Mm -hmm. But the Theravadans don't, huh? Right. Um, partly because, again, dealing with my teacher and his students, their perceptions of what was happening to individual people as they passed away did not all fall into the same three-day, ten-day, seven-day, whatever pattern. Some people go right away, other people hang around. It's really a karmic kind of thing. That makes sense. And, you, and 
maybe this isn't a very diplomatic thing to say, but you know, they have a similar sort of tradition in China where there's a certain X number of days where you have to chant this and X number of days where you have to chant that. And it's a good income for the monks and nuns. I'll just stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's move on to truth. I want to give a longer treatment of this than I did for goodwill, largely because there's so much misinformation on the issue. Um, if you read around in modern Buddhism, you're sometimes told that the Buddha doesn't teach the truth of statements of fact, he just teaches the truth of a person, and that the truth of the person is individual, i.e. what is true for you may not necessarily be true for somebody else. Therefore, you have to find your own truth. As for statements of fact, these will at best have pragmatic value. In other words, things are true that work for you, but again, what works for you may not necessarily be what works for other people. In other words, they work for you in the sense of getting what you want. And there's no objective standard in either definition of what it means for a statement for it to be true or what it means for a person to be true. Who does this sound like? What person in the news does this sound like? <laughs> and the question is, why is it that we like to have this idea of totally subjective truth as it applies to our own lives, but we don't like it when we, have, when we see it in politicians? <laughs> okay, this is all misunderstanding, about what, at least what the Buddha said. Um, the Buddha does teach pragmatic value, but he does have standards for what counts as what works and what doesn't work. You know the joke about you know, the pragmatic value of truth? A woman goes with a friend down to the police to report her, husband, her missing husband. And the police say, would you describe the husband for me? And she said he was tall, well-built, curly hair, blue-eyed. And the friend says, no, your husband is you know, short, dumpy, and bald. And the first woman says, who wants that one back? <laughs> <laughs> That's pragmatic truth, <laughs> which is not what the Buddha taught. Okay. okay, a lot of this misunderstanding comes from misinterpreting what the Buddha has to say about of the relationship of awakened people to truth statements. And there are passages where the Buddha says, you know, they do not hold to truths, they do not um, let, um, basically hold on to truths or find that truths you know, have a foothold in them. And this requires that you realize, one, he's talking about awakened people as, to, as opposed to people on the path. And that the, the Buddha actually does give objective standards for what it means to be true as a person and what it means for statements to be true and what kind of value would be the value that would say that something has pragmatic value as a truth. In terms of the truth of a person, he talks about the truth of teachers and the truth of students. In other words, for a teacher to take on a student, you want certain truth values or truth qualities of truth in that person. And basically, it means that the student is willing to reveal what's going on in their minds, whether it's skillful or unskillful, as it actually is. He doesn't want the student, you don't want a student who hides things from you. As for the truth value of a teacher, you want to look at the teacher, and this just takes time to get to know the teacher. Does this teacher have any greed, aversion, and delusion that would get this teacher, one, to claim to know things that he or she did not know, or two, to tell someone else to do something that would not be in that person's best interest? So that's, those are the kinds of truths you're looking for in, an, in another person. Of course, it means you want to look for them in yourself as well. That you are willing to admit your own mistakes to a teacher, so that the teacher can help you. Because if you can't admit them to yourself, you start hiding, you can't admit them to the teacher, you start hiding them from yourself. And then you'll never be able to observe what your actions are and what their real, real results are. Another quality of truth, and the truth of a person that you're looking for in a student, is that the student is true in sticking to commitments and to the path of virtue, concentration, and discernment. In other words, to, to learn the truth you have to be true in sticking to things. 
Others say, well, you know, I tried concentration for two days, I didn't get an awakening, it must not work. Okay, you're not putting in enough. It's going to take more time. You also have to be true in relinquishing things. In other words, when you give something up, you really give it up. There's that famous passage in the uh, Mahabharata Nirmana Sutta where you know, the Buddha lays these hints for Ananda, you know, the, you know, a person who has developed the f four bases of power could stay for the full you know, 120 years of a human lifetime. And Ananda doesn't pick up the hint, and so Ananda goes away. And then Mara comes and invites the Buddha to go. And so after a conversation, the Buddha says, okay, he gives up the will to continue living beyond another three months. And then and there's an earthquake, and another comes and says, you know, why, why was that great earthquake? And the Buddha gives a list of events that could give, cause earthquakes like that. And one of them is that, the, you know, the Buddha has given up the will to continue living more than three months. And Ananda says, oh, could you please stay longer? And the Buddha says, once I've given something up, I don't take it back. And that's the kind of person you're dealing with when you're dealing with the Buddha. He, when he gives it up, he really gives it up. That's the kind of truth of value, or the truth quality, the truth that we have there. So that's when the Buddha's talking about the truth of a person, these are the qualities he's talking about. You report your actions as they generally are. And you are, you don't pretend to be something that you're not, either as a student or as a teacher. And secondly, when you give something up, you really give it up. When you develop something, you really develop it. You stick with it all the way through. So it's not a matter of, you know, what's true for me is just true for me. There's an objective standard here about what we're looking for as truth in a person. Truth is a quality of statements. First off, you have to remember that when the Buddha says the word truth, it means both a statement and the fact about which the statement is referring to. Like he talks about nirvana as a truth, in the sense of it's being unchanging. And so it's not just statements about nirvana are true, but also the nirvana itself is a kind of truth. It's a fact. But then you make true statements about that, things that actually correspond to what the quality of that thing is. Those would be true statements. And so the Buddha's view on true is, that even though he focuses on teaching truths that are pragmatic, the idea of something being beneficial, the idea of something being true, those are two distinct ideas. There's a passage where he talks about the things he would say. One is that they would be true. Secondly, they'd be beneficial. They're two separate things. Because there are a lot of things that are true that are not beneficial. So he wouldn't say them. And then the third condition would be, is this the right time and place for that statement? Is this the right time and place to be gentle in stating it? Is this the right time and place to be a little more harsh in stating that? You have to read the situation. It's part of that dimension of discernment that we talked about earlier, knowing the right time and place for things. Okay. In terms of statements, the, if you look in the Vinaya, when the Buddha talks about statements of truth or perceptions of truth, there are basically three types that he's talking about. First of all, just that one, a, perception, a true perception. You know, there talks about issues, say, you know, for a, a monk to, with lustful thought, to touch a woman is, is an offense, a pretty serious offense. Um, if, however, he perceives this person to be a man, even though it's not really a man, it's really is a woman, that lessens the offense. But it means it's a false perception that so changes the quality of the, of, the, of, the, of the offense. So there is a correspondence between true perceptions and actual facts. So there is a correspondence theory of truth that we're dealing with here. Second one is if you make an accusation against somebody, they will ask you, did you hear this or did you see this or did you just suspect it? What's the evidence that you're using? And you have to be true about stating your evidence. If you lie about the evidence, you're at fault. So in other words, you, you suspect something, but you say, oh, I actually saw it with my own eyes. You know. That would be a false statement. So there's a tr with the truth of citation. And I'm telling you these things because they're going to be relevant to the path, the practice for lay people too. And then finally, there's the truth of narrative. If you are being accused of an offense, you have to give a true account of what you did or didn't do. If you give a false account, thunder and lightning fall on you. <laughs> well, not quite, but 
heavy punishment comes down for lying about what you did. So this idea that the Buddha never had a correspondence theory of truth certainly doesn't hold up in the Vinaya. You've got these three kinds of truth. One, your perception is an accurate perception of what's out there. Two, when you are laying claim to knowing something, you have to be able to cite okay, correctly, this is the way I came to that conclusion, or this is the why I believe this, what were the evidence that shining. And then the third one is if you're asked to, give, asked to give an account of what you did, you have to give an accurate account. These were the actions I did. So this works not only in the Vinaya, but also in meditation practice. Okay. First, mindfulness requires that you have an accurate perception of what's going on. In other words, you, you know, sensual desire arises in the mind. You do not want to see this as analysis of qualities, or a factor for awakening. You have to see it. This is a hindrance. You have to recognize it's a hindrance. So your perception of the situation in the mind has to be accurate as to what's actually going on. So that's the first thing of. Uh, this is discernment, but again, discernment has to be true. It has to deal with true perceptions, right? Okay, your discernment is false. It's false. Yes, then it's not genuine discernment. This is why. This is how the. Tr- you know, the, the two of the, the two qualities go together. But you know, if you're practicing mindfulness, you can't lie to yourself about what's happening in your mind. So that one, there has to be a true perception of what's actually going on. So there is a correspondence between my perception and, or there's a question of correspondence. The perception has to be an accurate perception of what's going on. The second one, the truth of citation, saying in the case, okay, this is the basis on which I'm saying this. There's that passage where the Buddha talks about safeguarding the truth. If you believe something because you reasoned it through, okay, I believe this because I reasoned it through. If you believe something because it, you're getting it on authority, you say, well, I'm actually taking this on authority, of somebody else's authority. You don't claim to say, well, I, I know this, I saw this myself, okay, because that, that gets into a lot of dishonesty. So there has to be a correspondence between what is the basis for my actually believing this and what is... What am I claiming as, as a basis for believing this? And then finally, there's the truth of narrative, which is understanding cause and effect. In other words, I did X, and this is what happened as a result. And it starts out with the Buddhist te- I'll get to you in a minute. Yeah. It starts out with the Buddhist teachings to Rahula, his son. The very first Dharma teaching is, when you do something, ask yourself, what is my anticipation, what do I anticipate as a result of this action? If you anticipate harm, you don't do it. If you don't anticipate harm, you go ahead and do it. But while you're doing it, if harm comes up, you have to recognize that, okay, this actually came from that action, I've got to stop. Or if you realize, okay, after you did the action, harm came from this action, I should not do this again. You have to be able to give account to yourself about what I did and what came about as a result. So when the Buddha is talking about truth, there has to be a certain correspondence between what you're telling yourself and what, you know, what actually happened. So this idea that there is no correspondence theory of truth in Buddhism is, doesn't correspond to the truth of Buddhism. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually an important part of the practice, that you are able to accurately report to yourself, this is what I perceive, this is why I believe this, this is, I did this, and this is what actually happened as a result, so in terms of the narrative. For your practice to get anywhere, you have to have this ability to make true statements about what's going on in your practice. What's really working, what's not. Um, Where's the disconnect if someone truly believes that they did or did not do something, but they did it, in actual fact? Okay, then the the question comes up, okay, why are they, are they in denial? Are they just simply not paying attention? Those are the two main things. Either you're not really, you're not really paying accurate attention to what you're doing. Your attention is someplace else, so you miss the connection. Or you're there, but you want to, You don't want to even think about it. There was a interesting article by um, Malcolm Gladwell that was in the New Yorker several years back. It's called "The Physical Genius," 
you know, I was talking about people who develop, you know, what is it about people who develop manual skills or skills in sports or skills in music? What is it that differentiates people who, from, who, are, who are good at the skill from people who are really good at the skill? And one of the things is, one of the dis, um, connecting things there is, they actually see, this is what I did and these are the results I got and the results are not satisfactory, I've got to go back and change. And there's an interesting anecdote they were telling, in the, in, it, they told in the, in the article that there's a medical school, that special, they had a, a program in brain surgery. And the problem with you know, training brain surgeons is that you know, everybody who applies to the program has A's on their record. Now, not everybody who has A's on their record is going to be a good brain surgeon. And they have to figure out, how would you interview these people so you get an idea of who would be a brain, good brain surgeon, who would not be a good brain surgeon. So they went back and they interviewed people who had failed the program. And one of the things they found out was, um, you know, you'd have this kid who had done, made a huge mistake. And then, but if you asked him about it, he would deny responsibility for it. And so they figure out, okay, if you're going to interview people, you've got to ask, the first question you ask them, could you tell us about a mistake you made recently? And if the person says, I can't think of any mistakes I made recently, out. Second question, okay, if they do admit a mistake, then the second question is, how would you do it again differently? And if they hadn't thought it through, out. It's the people who see, okay, I made a mistake, and I've got to think away, so I'm not going to make that mistake again. That's what you're looking for in someone who's going to practice. But you get some people who are just total denial, or just, you know, the, the, you know kind of spacey. Those that tend to be the two reasons why you would, there would be a disconnect. Any other questions about that? There's issues on truth. We've got some more. Just a second. Where is the traveling mic? Is there a true account of where the traveling mic is? Okay. <laughs> where is it going? We're right here. On page nine, it says that the Buddha said, "I, I want only the highest and most certain happiness and ease." Mm-hmm. And then he adds to that, other than that, I don't want anything else in the world. Mm -hmm. So then are all us non-monks screwed? (laughs) (laughs) You're not Buddhists, okay? (laughs) (laughs) No, but so so is there sort of a category that you have to be a monk in order to attain? Because I know some lay people that I'm convinced are stream enterers, but they had to be very dedicated to the practice. So could you speak a little bit about, you know, how to balance having children and having a career and kind of the real problems we lay people face as, as opposed competition? to the unreal problems that monks have? And <laughs> <laughs> I, I think monks have it easy because it's all... It's all aimed very, that way. Yeah, it's aimed perfectly. Okay, it's, it's basically how you spend your spare time. That extra time you have. You're going to check your emails 50 times a day or you're going to say, okay, I only did check them X number of times a day. <laughs> Sorry, wrong well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Or I get home and I say, gee, I'm really tired. I, should, I need to treat myself to another TV program or a couple of video games. Or you know. It's the people who, as, as John Fung said, are crazy about meditation. You've got five free minutes, I want to meditate. You need to find ways of fitting it into the nooks and crannies. And then as, you know, just like a little plant that gets into the nooks and crannies of a, a sidewalk, it begins to expand and, and, and Expands the cracks. And can we find any teachings within children? Because well, they, I, you know, nothing makes me bristle as the idea my child is my Zen master. <laughs> 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 but you can say, in raising my child, I'm certainly learning a lot of endurance, I'm learning a lot of equanimity, I'm learning a lot of, you know, determination. That's, that's why... The perfections are a good way of looking at that. Yes, in the back. So, mic in the back. There's a mic back there. So, you said that you had met some lay people who you were convinced were stream enters. Mm-hmm. What convinced you? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> One night I happened over here at John Fung teaching someone. I was thinking, what, what she's going through right now sounds an awful lot like stream entry. Uh, 
Um, what would be some qualities of a person who has attained stream entry? Well, the traditional ones are that this person will never intentionally break the precepts again. Um, beyond that, you cannot really judge someone else's uh, someone else's attainments, except that if they were going on breaking the precepts, you know, I'm pretty sure, pretty sure they're not. <laughs> Thank you. Now, the Buddha does talk about the wrong use of truths. In other words, you can have right views, but you use them in the wrong way. Um, one is to draw improper inferences. And there's this one sutta where the Buddha says that he, two of his teach, teachings fall into two categories, those from which you can draw inferences and those from which you can't. In other words, the ones from which you can draw inferences, that's not the complete statement of that truth. And you can sort of work your way through from that. And the other one is, okay, that's the complete statement. Don't take it further than that. Unfortunately, he does not give examples. So, but just kind of alerts you. In one way, however, that you could judge this is if you're going to take one of his teachings and use it to answer a question that the Buddha refused to answer. Wrong use of the truth. Okay. Like the example we had this morning about the Buddha never answered the question whether or not there is a self. There are people who will infer from some of his other teachings that basically there is no self. Wrong inference. Which is why it's good to know what are the questions that the Buddha did not answer. It's good to have, a, have those in the back of your mind. So that you can see if someone comes up with a question like that, or you come up with a question like that, you say, I think that's better left unanswered. Move on. Another wrong use of them is to develop pride. I have right view, all these other people have wrong view. There's a great passage where the Ananda says, someone who has a lot of learning but prides himself over their learning is like a blind person holding a lamp for other people. In other words, maybe they're helping other people but they're not, they're not seeing anything from the lamp that they're holding. And then the final, third use of misuse of truths is to engage in debates, not with the purpose of straightening out the other person, but sure, basically to win, to beat, defeat the other guy. Because you see in the canon, there are, t there are times when the Buddha will take somebody on in a debate. But he lays down certain conditions. Okay, I will join in a debate if you hold to accepted standards of what's consistent and what, you know, keep truthful about what you're saying and if there's anything I say that you don't understand, please ask questions first before you attack it. Those are sort of basic rules of thumb. Or there are other times when he knows that the opponent is not going to listen, but there are a lot of people watching, and for their sake he will engage the person in debate. But beyond that, just to defeat the other person, it's, it's, not, it's a mis misuse of right view. Now, ultimately, and this is where the statements say in the Atta Gavaga come, there comes a point where it, after you've attained stream entry, or after you've attained arahantship, you don't have any more need for true statements. You are no longer you know, bound to the true statements. Not that you're going to lie, but you don't have to depend on those statements anymore because you found the truth itself. This is where they say you know, that the enlightened one is beyond truths, or the enlightened one is not fastened to truths. Now, this doesn't mean that they don't know the difference between true and false, but for them, they don't need them anymore to describe the state they have. So it's important to understand when the Buddha is talking about the relationship of a person on the path to truth as opposed to a person who's finished the path. While we're on the path, we still need to hold on correctly to right views, because we still need them to give us guidance. Any questions on the issue of truth? Or is it that time in the afternoon? <laughs> okay. So until stream entry then is um, our task to find where our discernment is lacking? Right. 
then the question of whether your discernment is lacking, then the question is why is it lacking? Maybe you're lacking in, dis- lacking in virtue, maybe you're lacking in concentration, lacking in mindfulness. So it could be any of those could be any of those. I mean, remember, it's all eight factors of the path come in here. And they're all working together. They're all working together. Okay. But what's going, to be, what's going to be the final sort of thing that switches from the mundane to the transcendent will be an act of discernment. Okay. But it's, you've got the conditions have to be right for that act of discernment to really make a difference. So it's not necessarily that we're not being truthful with ourselves. We may be making accurate statements, but we're missing something, some other piece. Sometimes, some sometimes other... the, you know, the truth is more, the necessary truth is more refined than you're noticing. Okay. And so, sometimes you're asking the wrong questions. So then possibly switch your questions. Mm-hmm. Or how would you bounce off, how, how would you question your truth? How would you challenge your truth to say, hmm, you know, to like the, the fish in water, to challenge your own surroundings to get, not, you know, well, knocked this off? Why this is why it's good to have a teacher to sort of see that you're still, you know, you're still swimming around in a little tank. And the teacher says something, says, well, maybe there's something outside the tank. There's a John Mahabhu has a famous passage where he, the one time he argued with the John Mun, because he was, as he said, he was really stuck on his concentration. He was convinced all I have to do is kind of make this stronger, and it's going to become, you know, the deathless. And the John, I don't, we don't. The problem is, John, we don't know what a John Mun said, or we don't know how a John Mahabhu argued with him. But he finally realized, okay, I was, I had, I was totally wrong about what I had to do. And so it t- takes something coming in from outside to go against what you, sometimes there are things you really believe very strongly in, and, and you look in the text and the text seem to confirm what you're saying. So it was definitely Ajahn Mun doing, saying something or... Ajahn that, Mun said something to Ajahn Mahabo that, that took him, it's kind of basically sideswiped him and took him from an angle he hadn't expected. Because sometimes, sometimes you can get stuck in something and it makes sense to you totally. But someone looking from the outside can see that, okay, there's this limitation. I saw one case, there was this one monk whose insight was that things are the way they have to be and making any change away in the way they are is going against the Dharma. And so he, you know, he saw this one woman who he had known very well um, wearing lipstick. He says, this is against the Dharma. You know, your lips are not, you know, not red, this kind of thing. And it's, okay, it's obvious, looking from the outside, what are you doing trying to change the way she is? You know? If trying to change things is against the Dharma, then why are you trying to change her? You know? But you know, he, he didn't see that, and he wouldn't listen to that from anybody else. But he came to see a John, Maha, he came to see a John, Ma, a John Fuang. And a John Fuang kind of took him around and finally landed on that. And that was it. That kind of broke the bubble. Because it takes one, someone coming from the outside, two, someone you're willing to listen to. And even in a case like that, like in John Fung's case, he said, you know, I'm convinced that John Fung could read minds. And if you asked him about it, he'd glare at you so you could never talk about it, but I was convinced he could read minds. But he did say one time, so even when you can read minds, it doesn't mean you know what to say to that person, unless you really know the person well. And in this case, he, he, John Frank had taught that person for a year, so he was able to kind of, okay, this is the person you have to come and come around before we get there. So it requires, this is why, this is why we, a teacher is a really important asset. Another case, though, where John Fung himself had an extremely bad headache. He found out later it was because he had kidney stones. But he was, he was trying Western medicine, he was trying Thai medicine, he was trying Chinese medicine, nothing worked. And it was, it was getting worse and worse and worse. And it got so that he actually had to have a couple of people lying in his room at night in case he woke up and they would give him hot compresses and that kind of thing. Um, and so one night he happened to wake up and the people who were supposed to be looking after him were asleep. <laughs> and so he sat up and he said, well, I mean, who's looking after whom here? 
<laughs> he says, well, I can't get to sleep. I might as well meditate. So I sat and meditated. And then he realized, oh, I've been trying to get rid of the pain. And the Buddha says, pain is not something you get rid of. It's something you try to comprehend. He said, oh, that, you know. And that, and that's, that's, that's a moment of mindfulness. There was, you know, there was the, you know, there's something he knew, but it hadn't, the mindfulness hadn't applied to the, pro to the problem. And it's when you see, oh, this lesson I learned over here actually applies here as well. So that's one way you can kind of break through your own, your own inability to see what you're doing. In that case, it was just kind of this moment of awe. Oh, But there was a similar one where, again, this was a case of a teacher. There was a meditation monk who lived in Bangkok. His name was Jokun Na. Long stories about this one, but this, this particular story, he lived in a part of the monastery. They brought electricity in every other part of the monastery, but he asked that they not have it where he was because he wanted to live simply. And he was doing walking meditation in front of his hut one night, and this young monk comes up to him and says, there's this problem that's been you know, eating away at me for days. I can't get it out of my mind. Is there anything you can tell me what to do? But, and the joke and all looked at him and said, you're doing the wrong duty. He went into his hut, closed the door. Now fortunately that monk remembered, oh, what are your duties with regard to the Four Noble Truths? The cause of suffering is something you abandon. I've been developing the cause of suffering. So that's, that's a good th you know, sort of rule of thumb to begin with. If I actually applied the Four Noble Truths to what I'm suffering from right now, Am I doing the right duty in line with the truth? That's one place to start. Anything else about Chris? Do you have a do you have mic? To your left. Realizes the ultimate meaning of the truth with his body. Mm -hmm. I just wonder if you could comment on that, some reconciling that with the beyond space and time idea. Okay. Where you are going to see the deathless is right where your body is right now. In other words, it's not just a concept, but your whole experience will be taken up by that experience. Okay. Mm -hmm. Question over here? Is there a mic over here? Uh, a question that uh, was asked what, when uh, we were discussing this was, um, sorry, <laughs> was uh, how how do we spend how do you spend your spare time? Uh, it was one. Of the, it was a question that was uh, that you s mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, I I find myself spending a lot of time um, um, uh, distracting myself. Mm -hmm. And um, I would appreciate if you um, uh, uh, discuss that a bit. What's there to say? Don't distract yourself. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> and I know um, uh, um, uh, some of the Eastern um, 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 monks will say that um, uh, Westerners uh, waste an enormous amount of time, and I I think that I I, I indeed do that. Would I, I would really appreciate you talking about that? Okay, you can sit down at the end of the day and make a diary. What did I do today? And if it, it comes up with, you know, I watched soaps. <laughs> do people watch soaps anymore? Um, no. No. Okay. <laughs> okay, but just you know, if you if you actually truthfully report to yourself, this is how I spent my time distracting myself. And then the next day you do that again, the next day you do that again. And after a while you say, I would like to write something better. And then you have to get up in the morning and say, what, what's, what is the narrative I would like to write about my day today? And then think about, okay, what do I have to do in order to be able to do that narrative? So that at the end of the day I can write down, today I actually meditated, or today I did something that I thought was useful for myself. And this is what I did. And after a while, once you've gotten more and more used to that, then, it, then, you, then you're not going to need these reports. But you might use that as a crutch in the meantime to give a truthful account of how did I spend my day. 
I don't like the truthful account. <laughs> but that might be a way of getting well, think into of, it. Think about yourself like being a lawyer, you're going to write down your billable hours. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Is there such a thing as wasting time during meditation? Oh, wasting time during meditation happens all the time. <laughs> <laughs> What do you do about that? You tell yourself, okay, if I have some problems that I have to think about, I will think about them at the end of the meditation. And you actually might make a list before the meditation. These are the problems that are, 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 are occupying my mind right now. I'm going to write them down so that I don't think I would tell myself I have to remember them. And then at, give myself 10, 15 minutes at the end of the meditation. Okay, this is my time to think about those problems. But in the meantime, you know, no thinking about those problems at all. So the part of the mind that says, well, this is a real problem in my life, I've got to think about it. And it sees, wow, this is open field, a you know, whole hour of meditation. I could think about all kinds of things. You say, no, this is not the time for that. I need to get some time in order to get the mind settled down. And then at the end of the hour, you know, you're, you're, hopefully your mind's like clearer through having done the meditation so that you'll be able to think the problem through a lot more clearly. Using combination of metta and insight, um, remembering metta is a way of sort of clearing the decks before I sit down and meditate. I'm doing this for my own good. I'm doing this for the good of the people around me. And that if there are any sort of leftover issues from the day, you can say basically, I, I'm not going to hold any ill will for the people who abuse me today. I'm not going to hold any ill will to myself. And that way, so it kind of clears the deck so you can sit, sit down and be with the breath. If you find that there are other issues that are sort of getting in the way, there are other contemplations to do before you sit down and meditate. Um, to basically get you to see, I don't need to be thinking about that, whatever the issue is. But there are sort of short-term kind of karate chops you give to that, okay, I don't need that. Then you give metta at the end of the meditation as a way of sort of establishing your intention as you go out into the world for the meditation. Remember, okay, I want to have goodwill for all the people I see on the media, all the people that I deal with in my work, um, kind of bring that into the world. So that, that you're doing for other people. Okay. Question here? Mike? I spent a lot of my life as a big uh, trance addict. Uh, screens, movies, mm -hmm. uh, books, mm -hmm. and uh, aka distraction addict. Mm -hmm. and what started to help me was more insight into why I was doing it. Mm -hmm. Like in my case, I was medicating pain. Mm -hmm. um, so that, and then I began to um, be able to more address the pain. Mm -hmm. and so that just wanted to share that, and, and that was another. That was something that really helped me to deal with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, let's move on to virtue. We've got half an hour to talk about virtue. Or maybe we can get to persistence too. Okay, when the Buddha is talking about virtue, for the lay people, it involves the five and the eight precepts. The five precepts are no killing, no stealing, no illicit sex. Illicit sex means sex. If you are in a committed relationship, having sex outside of the relationship, um, sex with minors, sex with people who have taken a vow of celibacy, or sex with other people who are in other committed relationships. That's, that's what's out. No lying and no taking of intoxicants. The eight precepts are no killing, no stealing, no sexual intercourse at all. No lying, no intoxicants, no eating after noon or before dawn. No going to shows, wearing cosmetics, wearing perfumes, decorating the body. And then no sleeping in high and luxurious beds. Generally, the eight precepts are meant to be taken periodically. Some people in Thailand will take them, say, once a week. Or they take them for, say, the rains retreat for three months. But the five precepts are considered basic. Um, 
it's interesting that in under the under the description of right action, there are only three of those actions are included under the path: no, no killing, no stealing, no illicit sex. Under right speech, in addition to no lying, they also have no divisive speech, no coarse speech, and no idle chatter. And those last three are not treated by a precept at all, and there's a reason for this, um, which is that under the precept against lying, it's meant to be across the board. You do not misrepresent the truth. What you say is an accurate description of what actually happened. However, with divisive speech, harsh speech, or coarse speech, and idle chatter, one, in the, in the case of divisive speech, there are cases where what is t technically divisive speech, um, in other words, divisive speech is when you are trying to prevent a friendship between two people, or trying to break up a friendship. There are some kind of cases where you see that, you know, you know X is going to, is becoming, to develop a, a friendship with Y. Y has been known to mistreat people in the past. And you might want to warn X about this. And for the monks, there's actually this opening in, in their, their rule against divisive speech, that you can actually talk to X about this. Now, the warning signal is there is that X might think, well, you're jealous. So you have to be very careful about how you approach this topic. But there is this kind of loophole, so this is why there is no precept against it. Similarly with harsh speech, there are times when you have to say, no, don't do that, it's going to burn you. you know? <laughs> And you, to get that person's attention, sometimes you have to use harsh speech. I mean, there's a, the famous case where the Buddha called Devadatta a lickspittle, which is one of those great Shakespearean insults that you <laughs> don't hear anymore. Now, there was the kind of person who, when someone else just spit something else out, you pick it up and eat it. Right? That's a lickspittle. Which was basically to you know, warn the monks who were sort of siding with Devadatta, okay, Devadatta has really seriously gone off the track. So there's, there was a purpose in that. Again, you have to be really careful about how you use this kind of speech. But there are these openings. So it's a, a general principle, but it's not a precept. And then finally with idle chatter, there's no way you can have a precept against idle chatter. <laughs> it's like, it's like you know, forbidding Hurricane Irma from forming. You know? <laughs> it's going to happen. There's no way you're going to stop it. You warn people about, okay, you have to be really careful about and idle chatter, what is that? It's basically opening your mouth without really knowing exactly what you're going to say or why you're going to say it, but you open your mouth and start speaking. Now, there's some idle chatter which is kind of social grease. You know, you're working together in an office, you have to chat up to people around you so that everybody's on friendly terms. And this is a case where, again, you have to read the situation, how much grease is going to stop the working of the engine and how much grease is needed. So those are cases where you develop your discernment finger, okay, Okay, the general principle warns against this, but is this a particular case where I would have to, you know, where it is actually a legitimate way of breaking what would have been a precept otherwise? But the precept against lying, that's across the board. And in that case, you develop your discernment not by figuring out when to lie and when not to lie. It's more, if there's some information that I have and I'm afraid the person I'm talking to would might abuse it, how do I not give that information without lying? And that requires a lot of skill. I was knowing, knowing how to change the topic, knowing how to ask questions. You know, the woman who's concerned that her husband is having an affair, and you've actually seen the husband with the other woman. And the woman asks you, have you seen my husband with this other woman? You don't want to get involved for whatever reasons you have. What do you do? You ask, why are you concerned? And to get her to talk. And hopefully she's not going to ask you the question again. But again, here's another case where you have to be clear about what are my reasons for not divulging the information? Is it really for to protect someone that, who legitimately needs protection? You've got to be honest with yourself about how you deal with this particular, particular aspect. But from the, for the priest, purpose of the precept, you do not say anything that misrepresents the truth. You know, if, if truth is X, you don't say not X. So everybody, you've got to be careful. Immediate questions. Can I?
Can I finish the description of virtue and then we'll, then we'll take questions again? Okay. Okay. Now, taking on the precepts. This is related both to truth and to goodwill. In other words, you have made up your mind. You, it's a free choice that you make your mind you're going to follow these precepts. And the freedom is here is not just doing what you want to do. It's being free to do things that are not harmful. Free in doing what you know will lead to the best long-term results. And it's also an expression of goodwill. You don't want to harm yourself through your actions, through your, your words and your deeds. And you don't want to harm anybody else by getting them to break the precepts. Okay. As an expression of goodwill for others, basically you're also giving them safety. This passage where the Buddha said, if you make up your mind that you are not going to harm anybody, you're not going to kill anybody, not steal under any circumstances, not have illicit sex under any circumstances, not lie, not take intoxicants under any circumstances, you are giving universal safety to everybody else. And when you give universal safety, you have a portion of that safety for yourself. So, that, in the Buddha's analogy, or the image he gives in the Dhammapada is if your hand does not have a wound, you can pick up poison and not be harmed by it. But if you have a wound in your hand, the poison will kill you. The wound here would be the fact that you had broken a precept. The benefits for yourself in the present lifetime, the heedfulness of observing the precepts, and this is in Deacon Nagai 16, leads to wealth, it leads to a good reputation. When you go into meetings of people, you do it unabashed. I like that. In other words, you don't have any bad actions and your people are going to say, I saw you the other day and doing such and such. You know that whatever, the, if someone gives an accusation like that, it's not true. You die unconfused. Now the Buddha does recognize there are times when following precepts could lead to a loss of wealth, health, your relatives, but he regards those losses as unimportant. In other words, you don't lie for the sake of protecting a relative. You don't steal for the sake of protecting a relative. Realize, okay, that relationship is something that's going to end, but your precepts are your gift to yourself and your gift to others. What this means in case of, you know, if you're going to engage in social action, you have to engage in social action that does not involve breaking the precepts. You think of social action as kind of a gift to others, and we'll be talking about this more tomorrow when we talk about generosity. But if, you, you know, if your social action involves lying, okay, you better change the social action you're involved in. The Buddha also talks about the benefits in terms of rebirth. We'll talk about that when we look at the passages. And also be your meditation benefits. Uh, it's a good basis for mindfulness practice, because you basically remember mindfulness is the ability to keep something in mind. If you have done harm to some, somebody, it's going to be like a wound on your mind, and you're going to want to forget it. Either you forget it or you deny it, or you, or you deny that it was actually harm, both of which will not be good for your insight and not be good for your concentration. This is why the precepts are a good basis for mindfulness practice. The Buddha says you have lack of remorse as a result of holding the precepts, again, which is useful for giving rise to a sense of joy, that which then becomes part of the, the fuel for your concentration. And also it helps develop the qualities that you're going to use in mindfulness practice, i.e. mindfulness, the ability to keep the precept in mind. Alertness, watching what you're actually doing to make sure it's in line with the precept. And then ardency, okay, if you find that it's difficult to hold the precept, you make whatever net, net effort is needed to bring yourself up to the Buddhist standards. So these are the three qualities you're going to need in mindfulness practice, and you're getting practice in them in day-to-day -day life as you take on the precepts and hold to them. Now John Lee has a nice passage, which we also have in the readings, where he relates the five precepts to overcoming the five hindrances. My favorite one is to say, if you take other people's bad habits and you think about them, you've stolen their bad habits. Because you didn't ask them. <laughs> Permission. <laughs> so, ill will is basically theft.
And also, as I said earlier, we, we're talking about the precepts as an expression of both truth and goodwill. In terms of being an expression of truth, on the one hand, as a truth as a quality of the person, you stick with these training rules in all situations with no exceptions. As a quality of statements, truth is you know, okay, not lying, remember, for the Buddha, is the fundamental virtue. There's one passage where he says, if there's this one thing, if you feel no, no shame over telling a deliberate lie, then there's no evil you won't do. And it's interesting, looking in the Jataka tales, um, there are cases where it's obvious that the Buddha-to-be is learning the ropes, because he, occasionally he will kill, occasionally he will steal, occasionally he will have illicit sex, occasionally he will take intoxicants. He never lies. For him, that's kind of the basic, basic principle that starts, starts the rest of virtue. There is, however, a difference between truth as a perfection and the precept against lying. The precept requires only that you speak in line with your beliefs. It was, I believe something is true, you report that, and there's no lie, even if it turns out your beliefs are wrong. However, truth as a, truth as a quality, of, as a perfection, means that you try your best to bring your beliefs in line with actu what, it, what actually is true. It's the next step beyond that. To see that the, the truths actually do correspond to what what is reality, and they really are beneficial. So truthfulness as a, pre as a perfection goes beyond simply not telling lies. It's, it's, you're trying to correct your beliefs and understanding of how, what really is a useful thing to be talking about. So those, that's the basic presentation on truth, or excuse me, on, on, on virtue as a perfection, an uh, expression of truth. Questions? There's a question in the back. Thank you, Bhante. The, um, the question, it's, it's more of a comment than a question. It has to do with being truthful with a person who is wrestling with dementia. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I have a mother-in-law who has dementia, and being truthful with her is is not is it can be. It, I'm, it's, it's, I find myself walking a tightrope without a net a lot of the time, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm not sure always how to maneuver and what to say to her that is that it, that, that doesn't cross over that line, and, and that's the struggle that I have with her. Okay, you have to find out exactly, and this is going to vary from person to person. What are the truths that get her upset, and what are the truths that don't get her upset? And also have a little bit more, what can I say, um, honesty about what you truly know and don't truly know? Like I know a woman whose, whose mother is constantly asking, when do I get to go home, when do I get to go home? And the answer is, I don't know yet. Hmm. Say more about that if you know. There's, there's, there are a lot of things you think you know, but you may, may not know. So you can say, okay, I don't know, I don't know. When she pushes you for something that you think you know, but remember, I don't really know this, so I can say truthfully, I don't know. And often that is the case. Often that is, well, exactly. Right. That's, right. that's why I say right. you can say this. But sometimes you do know information and. And her sense of reality is so distorted that anything you say is going to be misunderstood. Okay, then, and then so you it's change hard the topic. to change the change topic, the topic yeah. right? Because you're the right. people with dementia have very short memories. That's true. That's true. You know, my father was convinced. I mean, he he had dementia the last year of his life, and you know, he was complaining about this you know, this crazy dog coming into the house all the time. And if you told him there is no dog, he would get really upset. But you say, well, it's not there now. Yeah. I calm them down. Yeah. You have to work on, her, on their level to a certain extent and just kind of maneuver around them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. Sometimes you find yourself crossing over well, this, and you this, just try to, you try to move back into that, that, that appropriate space again. And this is why it's a good test of your discernment. Yeah. Yeah. Because the Buddha didn't say observing the precepts is going to be easy. <laughs> and this is where the practice of the precepts actually develops your discernment, in the sense of one, in the case of the three kinds of rights, wrong speech, where there actually are loopholes. Okay, are you honest with yourself when you're taking advantage of that loophole? 
And in the case of lying, okay, how do I not misrepresent the truth, but at the same time not say things that are harmful? Hmm. Difficult to do. Difficult to do. And sometimes you have to figure out how do you, okay, you, you risk getting her upset, but then you find a way to calm her down. Or as you say, changing the subject is often the most skillful thing to do. Right. Mm -hmm. And her memory is so short that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's just a difficult situation. Well, there, there, are always, there are always those issues that people say kind of test the precept. Um, years back, I was talking about the precepts. First, it was a group in, in Massachusetts. And the question came up, well, what about your tax returns? Do you have to really report everything on your tax returns? <laughs> I don't want to support the war. You know, that's the excuse they give. And they said, well, you know, just tell yourself, I'm supporting the Peace Corps. <laughs> <laughs> and then I came and I gave the same, same talk to Laguna Beach. And the, and the question that brought the discussion to an end was, your friend is wearing an ugly dress and she comes and asks you, how do I look? <laughs> And you have to tell yourself, well, she looks a lot better than she would naked. You look fine. <laughs> <laughs> you have to practice a lot of mental reservation. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. a question here? Apology? Mm -hmm. Did you have a question? Yeah, the question that I had was basically related to uh, divisive speech. Uh, sort of a situation like uh, at work typically happens sometimes um, uh, with people having some political relationships or something or they have such uh, maybe ambitions or whatever and uh, they might ask me something and I just don't want to get involved mm -hmm. <laughs> and Sometimes I end up saying something which later on I come to realize that actually triggered another argument and then I got involved or something of that sort. Mm -hmm. So um, over a period of time I came to realize what not to say uh, and things like that. But it also came to give me a sort of a headache with that kind of a workplace. Mm -hmm. uh, so. It just it just feels like uh, uh, a no, you know non monastic life would be uh, horrible. But is this something that happens in monks' life also? Like since you're discussing, since you're talking about you know not saying something that will um, you know harm you know divide two people or um, like for example, you know X is going to be an X monk is going to be a harmful person to... Y monk. Or Y monk is going to be harmful to X. Mm -hmm. And so you go and tell X that, okay, you want to be careful, don't take this person as the teacher or something of that sort, but you know that this person is is someone you can you can give that advice and he will respond properly to, to you. But is that is that some... Is there some sort of a political thing also among monks? Oh my gosh, and, monks have politics, yeah. So. We, had a, we had a really bad case in, in, when I was in Thailand. This monk who was out kind of taking donations from people but not using them for the purpose for which he claimed to be taking them. And, but I had to be very careful about who I mentioned this to, how I mentioned it. You can't just say it to everybody. And sometimes you have to learn how to, how do I just kind of gently broach the topic and, be, and get a pushback? Okay, stop. So essentially, uh, even in monastic life, you have the same sort of problems. Look, your defilements don't run She's away when you put on the robe, you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. It tends to be better at in really poor monasteries. Because everybody knows everybody's poor, so nobody's jealous. But as the money begins to do, come into the monastery, then people start thinking, well, gee, wouldn't it be comfortable to have this? Wouldn't it be comfortable to have that? And so you, know, you have to watch out for that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, could you please explain um, bringing our perceptions 
into line with what's really true? Is that like stream entry? Or No, I mean, it just starts with, you look at Rita and say, this is a woman. And you ask, Rita, are you a woman? She says, yeah. <laughs> so you start with basic stuff, you know. That's true. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you kind of build up to, okay, what's actually going on in my mind? You know, you read the list that the Buddha says, okay, can I recognize ill will? Can I recognize skillful mental states? Can I recognize unskillful mental states inside me? And you're going to, you start with the precepts, and then you kind of work in. More refinement. More refinement. But you're, as I said, your understanding of the meaning of the drama and your understand, has to understand, meet and climb, not only I know how to explain the words of this concept, but I also know where this leads. That's something that's going to start with stream entry. I mean, you can begin to see, like, some of the preliminary benefits of virtue. You know, you're taking them, before you start observing the precepts, you're taking them on faith. You may see it in other people, and certainly this person is truthful and other people respect them, I should learn to be truthful too. So it begins to give an inkling, but when you've seen for yourself, really confirm for yourself, okay, it was my actions, my unskillful actions, that got in the way of my seeing the deathless. Mm-hmm. i got to avoid that forever from now. That's when it gets confirmed. Yeah. So I imagine the precepts were um, given before globalization, before our lives became so inextricably connected with so many other things. So even just here with me today, my clothes have been involved in probably the corporations that made them are lying, or the bag that I brought is involved in the killing of an animal, or the check I pay for at a restaurant my husband is eating meat. So how do you deal with all of those kind of things that we're connected to? And then is there any specific thing about eating meat? Um, okay, one, there's nothing about eating meat. So killing animals and killing trees and... Well, again, it's, for the precept is, one, you don't do it yourself and you don't give the order to do it. That's how far the precept goes. Now, he's not making you totally pure in, in regard to your consumption of, consumption of samsara because our basic, our basic function, our basic activity that defines us as beings is that we have to feed. So they're going to be taking something from the environment. And the question is, how far do you want to start in your training of yourself to get beyond, so we can get out of the system so you really stop? Because it's only when you're out of the system entirely, you know, with, with, with full awakening, that you have no, you're not placing any burden on the, on the world at all. So as a training principle, you start, okay, I'm going to be very careful about what I actually do and what I tell other people to do what orders I give. You know, beyond, that, beyond that, the implication is, I buy this bag, but it turns out you know, they're exploiting the cotton farmers and exploiting the workers in the factory. I'm not responsible for that in terms of the precepts. But isn't that but then not when you start truthful? Think, well, it's, okay, again, for the purpose of training yourself to get out, this is what you focus on. And then you realize, okay, if I continue staying on here, and this is why we have the reflection on the requisites, Every use of a requisite is going to be placing a burden on someone else, so how can I minimize my impact? And that's part of a reflection on your use of things. So what am I buying? What am I ordering? Maybe I should step back on that. But that's, that's not under the precepts, that's under kind of more your discernment and your motivation to get, to get out. So from in India, being vegetarian is almost like a common sense thing to do if you want to have a good meditation practice. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So is that something we've kind of avoided here because it's just not part of the culture? Or? Well, certainly not the culture in Thailand. And you know, as monks, you know, we have to be dependent on everything that people give us. And we can't say, well, I, you know, I can't eat your meat, I'm sorry. And again, this, the, under, under the precepts, you say, okay, for the sake of this, I'm not going to go into a, fish, a restaurant where they have to, I have to say, you know, kill this fish to feed me. I can't do that. But beyond that, you told Thai people, most Thai people to be vegetarian. <laughs> they would say, you're crazy. <laughs> and 
I know there was a case when I was in Thailand, there was this one young couple. They live in this tiny, tiny shack. It was just big enough for the two of them to lie down. And there was a little sort of makeshift kitchen in the back, and that was it. And every now and then they would come out in front of the house and put a little piece of sausage or a little bit of dried fish or something in my bowl. There's no way you can not accept that. In fact, I would come back and say, okay, today you've been the beneficiary of a poor person's generosity. You better practice hard. You know, in that case, you see the gift as you know, the intention behind it. But that's a very different example from a McDonald's or a corporation that you, you see. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure you. I understand. I understand what you're saying, but in terms of the precepts, you say I'm not given the order to, to abuse the workers. But if there's, you know, if it's like if it's like Walmart, you know, stay away. Amazon, stay away, big time, you know. But that's just my own. And when you read about the workers at Amazon, you say, oh my gosh, it's inhuman. So, I mean, as that's my choice. I will not order anything from Amazon. But, but that's not a precept. That's more of a, you know, by being dragged, kicking and streaming into the digital world. <laughs> Rita, you have a question? <laughs> so, my question is also work-related. I have a new director and... Uh, those of us who report to this new director find his management style oppressive and dismissive, so he's not following our basic principles of communicating with each other, being respectful, and he'll just cut people off and things like that. So, of course, those of us who report to him are talking amongst e- each other, you know, how can we strategize to help change his behavior? So, um, That would not count as divisive speech. So I'm concerned about where the line is drawn with backbiting. So I've been trying to be truthful with my experience and be supportive of like mm-hmm. how we can help this person mm-hmm. change their behavior. But could you provide any guidance on what to be careful for to avoid the backbiting? If you're just thing? trying to let off steam, that's when it becomes divisive. So I could, can, I've noticed well, he's got this particular problem, but you want to say, okay, where do we think are the inroads on this person that we can actually start talking to him? So it's a combination of analyzing the problem and also analyzing the potential solution. So just venting is, is what to avoid, but have right. the venting be constructive to move it towards a more positive. Right. Uh, okay. Thank you. And also ask yourself that question. Okay, where does this person show a glimmer of you know, where we can connect? Because it's only through that glimmer that you're going to be able to do something positive. Okay, thank you. Tying into that question, is it not okay if uh, uh, just to just to have some humor? Because human beings do all sorts of funny and stupid things. You have things. to be very careful about your humor. But, a lot of wrong speech comes under the guise of humor. Right. So, coffee room humor about somebody who is being silly and all that is not is still not okay. You've got to figure out, okay, what, would, what, possible, what positive purpose is going to be served by this humor? Just, just letting off the steam and trying to get rid of the ill will. There are a lot of other, ways, let, lot of lot of other ways besides telling jokes about, this, about your boss. You know? I see. Okay. So before we conclude the afternoon, okay, one last question before I... Sorry, I, I just wanted to ask this. It, it, I hope it's not too crude, and I've done some. Re- I've tried to find an answer on this, but is in terms of the virtues, is there any th- sort of policy on like masturbation? No. <laughs> no. So it's dealer's choice, like. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> Monks are not allowed to masturbate. No. In fact, it's, it's, a, it's, fairly grave, it's a fairly grave offense for the monks. 
but that's largely because you know we're living off the gifts of other people, and you, you know what, there's the great line. You wouldn't imagine the gifts with which he accepts your offers, offerings is also the gifts with which he. You know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great line. It's one of the great lines in the video. Um, <laughs> but I don't want to know about what you're doing. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's look at some of the passages on virtue. Seventeen talks about the fact that you are. You know, there's no circumstances under which you would break the precepts. Therefore, you are giving universal safety to others, then you will have a share in that universal safety. Okay? You, you observe the precepts for your protection. The more, the more you, you do this without making exceptions, the more protection you get. If you find it easy to make exceptions, okay, you're leaving big holes open. And John Cha has a great example. He says, you've got a fence around your house, but you've got big holes in your fence. It's not going to be as protective as a face fence without holes. Passage 18 kind of gives you a, a list of, okay, if you do break the precepts, what, remember, these are tendencies. Where, did the, where does the breaking of the precepts tend to take you? Okay, taking of life leads to a short lifespan. Stealing leads to the loss of your wealth. Sexual misconduct leads to rivalry and revenge. Telling lies leads to being falsely accused. Device speech brings to, leads to the breaking of your own friendships. <laughs> like this, harsh speech leads to unappealing sounds. So next time you hear lots of really nasty noises while you're meditating, say, so I must have engaged in some harsh speech. Idle chatter leads to words that are not worth taking to heart. And the drinking of fermented and distilled liquors leads to mental derangement. There are other passages where the Buddha talks about things that are not related to the precepts, but also, you know, kind of the workings of karma, cause and effect. One of my favorite ones is, if you tend to give in to your anger, you tend to be ugly. No. And you don't have to wait for the next lifetime to see that one. Okay, passage 19 points out that observing the precepts is for your own benefit. Getting other people to observe the precepts is for theirs. So you're benefiting other people. When you observe the precepts, you're benefiting others and yourself. But at the same time, to go further than that, you try to, if you can, get other people to observe the precepts. You're really helping them, if you can. Now you have to learn how to do that without preaching. Passage 20 talks about the three kinds of loss. The Buddha says, I'm not really that serious. Loss of health, loss of wealth, loss of relatives. The three kinds, two kinds that are serious are loss of your virtue and loss in terms of your views, i.e. You develop the wrong view about actions and the results of actions. So when you start trying to excuse yourself, well, I have to break the precept in order to protect my relatives, I have to break a precept in order to protect my wealth or my health, okay, that's wrong view. You're actually harming yourself more. And then John Lee has these great analogies between the, the precepts. Learning how to observe the precepts is a way of getting you to overcome your hindrances. Ill will lies at the essence of killing because you're destroying your own goodness. And when our mind can kill off our goodness, what's to keep us from killing other people and animals as well? And then my favorite one, Restlessness lies at the essence of taking what isn't given. The mind wanders about taking hold of other people's affairs. Sometimes they're good points, sometimes they're bad. To pass none of the good points isn't too serious, for it could at least give us some nourishment. As long as we're going to steal other people's business and make it our own, we might as well take their silver and gold. <laughs> That's one of John Lee's great lines. <laughs> they're brought bad points, however, like trash they've thrown away, scraps and bones with nothing of any substance, and even so we'd let the mind feed on them. When we know that other people are possessive of their bad points and guard them well, <laughs> and yet we still take hold of these things, to think about it should be classed as a form of taking what isn't given. Sensual desires, of course, lie at the essence of sensual misconduct. Doubt lies at the essence of lying. In other words, our minds are unsure with nothing reliable or true to them. We have no firm principles and so drift under the influence of all kinds of thoughts and preoccupations. 
Drowsiness is like pre- is intoxication. Discouragement, dullness, forgetfulness, with no mindfulness or restraint. There's another passage where he expresses this by saying, it's like you're wandering down the street, weaving back and forth, and finally lying down drunk on the side of the road. That's sleepiness. Okay. So in this way you can think of observing the precepts as a way of preparing yourself for developing the right qualities for concentration. Any questions before we break for the day? Yes? There's a minor level of law. Mike? Mike? Just a minor letter of the law question. Non-alcoholic beer is 0.5% less alcohol by volume. As like a a substitute Mm -hmm. in a circumstance in which you would otherwise be drinking full-strength alcohol just to not stand out in a social situation. Is that breaking the precepts? If you can smell the alcohol, it would be breaking the precept. If you can smell it, it would Mm -hmm. be. So Mm -hmm. the best thing to do is say, my doctor says not to drink. And you don't have to tell them that the Buddha is your doctor and what disease <laughs> <laughs> and what disease he's trying to cure him. <laughs> I had that a couple of years back I was teaching in France and they really hold on to of course this is part of French culture and the person the question was, look, this precept has to change for France. <laughs> <laughs> If someone offers you a glass of wine and you refuse it, it's a huge insult. Okay. And so I came up with that answer. I said, we just tell them that your doctor says not to take it. And so the next question was, I'm visiting a friend's house on the bread, on the, on the table. Bread fresh from the oven, still crusty and warm. Uh, camembert au point, and a bottle of pomar, which I didn't know what it was, but apparently it's a really expensive wine. And so I consult my doctor, and he, would, he consult, would he advise Coke, <laughs> Coca-Cola? <laughs> and so I told him, the Buddha was not an American capitalist, he'd recommend San Pellegrino. San Pellegrino? Oh, San <laughs> Yeah, there are ways you can get out of it without insulting your friends and not standing out. Just say, look, my doctor says no. And it's not a lie. The Buddha is considered to be a doctor. Jeff? Um, Ajahn Fong talked much about life with Ajahn Lee. With Ajahn Lee? Yeah. Oh, yeah, all the time. What, what's your general impression of how it was to be a monk? Andrajan Lee, or a lay person. I mean, he sounds like an incredibly charismatic. He was extremely charismatic, and I'll, t- I'll tell you two stories. One, John Lee, had a, as you can tell, had a great sense of humor, but it was very hard for other people to get him to laugh. He could see a joke coming down a mile down the road. And, and, but there was apparently there was one Indian guy who was able to get a John Lee to laugh. And you'd know that this Indian guy was visiting the monastery because you hear John Lee chortling down at the, down in his hut. And the Indian guy, after getting, we realized that he had this special talent, getting closer and closer to John Lee this way. One day he said to John Lee, you know, I believe that you could actually tell me what the number is in the next lottery coming out. It was kind of a challenge. And then John Lee said, I could, but if it meant that your wife and children would die, would you want it? No. <laughs> um, the other story is, there was a tradition among John Lee's students that he was King Ashoka reborn. And when I learned this, I happened to get a book from um, Mochidal Marasadas, the, the printer in Delhi. For some, for some reason I got on their mailing list when I was in Thailand. And they had a biography of, of Ashoka. So I ordered it, just to learn more about Ashoka. And they had the edicts at the end. And one of the edicts, King Ashoka is saying to his, basically his government workers, if you want to be quick enough in satisfying me in the way you're doing your work, 
you have to know what I want before I do. So I translated that for John Fuhrer. He said, 2,000 years, he didn't change. <laughs> so, any questions? Yes. I kind of hesitate to ask this question because there's not too much too much there, but my, I grew up hunting and fishing, and uh, my dad's a big hunter still. It was always tough for me to kill, um, but it was a really, really important learning experience. Um, and he just went hunting yesterday, and he had, t- you know, 21 doves to, to, um, to clean, and for him it's the experience of, of going out and hunting it's it's i don't think he pay he, he cares too much about whether or not he's going to eat them and to mm-hmm. me it's it's um just knowing that he killed them it's like oh no you got to eat them you know if you killed them you have to eat them um so i mean what's what's what if I ate them knowing that they would rot otherwise mm-hmm. and is it a bad offense to help him um, you know, clean clean birds and uh, and be a part of that, you know, as a reflection and that sort of thing. Okay. Um, I would say, as long as you're not telling him to kill, it might, would not be a breaking the precept. Um, as for the doves, if you went ahead and eat them, dedicate the merit of your practice to the doves. That's the one thing you can do for them. It's okay to eat them oh, yeah. all to yourself, you know, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. How could you eat 21 doves? <laughs> <laughs> I would say don't keep them for yourself, you know, share them among your friends. You know? Pro- probably not 21, but... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, there was, a, there was a case where this guy went out and killed a deer in Thailand. And John Lee came along. He'd gone with, that, gone with that meal that day, but it was still before noon. And as he passes their house, they come out, and the woman comes out and says, my husband killed the deer. I want to feed a monk to help you know, assuage, the, you know, assuage the, the karma. And so he sits down and he accepts it because it was not killed specifically for him. Somebody would say, you know, I know, what, to whatever extent you can get your father to do something else besides <laughs> killing animals for fun. Um, to, you know, try to encourage him in another hobby if you can. Don't come on with a holier-than-thou attitude because he's not going to receive it, but just find out. You know. Yeah, that's really instilled in him since a young kid. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't mm-hmm. think that would ever change. But. No, but just find, give him something that's more interesting. Kind of distract him. Like when he has the thought and idea to go to try and distract him. Well, to go off. invite him to do something else instead. You know, you know, he tends to go out shooting on Saturday afternoons. Okay, find something else for him to do on Saturday afternoon. And I don't want to drag this out too long, but um, to me, you know, going out and, and being able to sustain your own food in that way is seems so much better. It makes more much more sense um, than than going to the grocery store and buying the chicken that is is there and I'm sure is killed in, in much less humane conditions. Mm-hmm. You know, you know where it's coming from. You know how the dove lived, or you know you know how it died. Um, you're connected to the process. I say, for your father's sake, you find some you know find other activities to entertain him on Saturday afternoons or whatever. Okay. Thank you for your attention today and for those of you who are coming tomorrow, we start at what, one thirty? One thirty. And we didn't do too bad. We covered four 
perfections. <laughs>